So, basics of sequences and series. Um, a sequence is a list of numbers in a pattern. So, it's not a random list of numbers. There's some pattern to the list. And sometimes the pattern's easy, and sometimes the pattern's hard. If it's a certain type of pattern, we have certain names. But just big picture, a sequence is a list of numbers that has a pattern. Um, finite versus infinite. Finite sequence would have an ending point. An infinite sequence would not have an ending point. Um, some notation here. We denote a sequence's terms with that little subscript in, and we call that the, the index, sort of the <coughs> the, the counter of the terms. What term are we on? We normally start with an index of 1. That way the first term is n equals 1, and the second term is n equals 2, and the third term is n equals 3. That's an easy way to do it. Um, but sometimes it's convenient to have our initial index be 0. That's exactly right. Computer science frequently starts with zero. starting with 0. Which is fine. It just depends on the application as to which one's better. But if you start at 0, your first term is n equals 0, and your second term is n equals 1. And so you're like, you're always off by a little bit. But there's computer science reasons to start at 0. There are two types of formulas that can be written um, or used for a sequence, um, recursive versus explicit. There are other ways to classify them, so this is like one method of classifying recursive versus um, e explicit. Recursive means like looking back, so a recursive formula uses previous terms to arrive at the new term. previous terms to arrive at the new term. I don't know if you've heard of the Fibonacci sequence. Anybody heard of the Fibonacci sequence? It like yes. yes, no, mostly no. Um, basically, you start with the two first terms are 1. After that, you add the previous two terms. So 1 plus 1 is 2, 1 plus 2 is 3, 2 plus 3 is 5, and so on. Um, so as a formula, you have to say that a1 is 1, a2 is 1. After that, a sub n, the next term, is the sum of the two previous terms. So if you're at a n, the, the, the term behind that one is n minus 1. And two terms back would be n minus 2. And so like if you think about, well, what is a3? So if n is 3, 3 minus 1 is 2, 3 minus 2 is 1. So yeah, a3 is a2 plus a1. With the recursive formula, you must be given at least one term of the sequence. Like you need a, you have to have a starting point. Or a starting term. And if the formula relies on more than one preceding term, then you need however many preceding terms it is to get going. Like you, right? I can't just say the nth term is the sum of the two previous terms if you don't know what the two previous terms are. So we have to give you a starting point. Number one, what are the first four terms of the sequence with the first term negative 3 and then a sub n equals a sub n minus 1 plus 7. I like to see a sub n minus 1. Just know that that means the previous term. So don't, don't get hung up on plugging in a sub 3, which means a sub 2. Just the previous term plus 7. 
So the first four terms. What's the first term? Some people get thrown off here. Negative, negative three. Right, some people are eager to say, ah, negative three plus seven, that's four. Well, it is, but the first term is still negative three. So A1 is negative three. The second term is the previous term plus seven. So that'd be four. A sub 3 would be the previous term, plus 7. So 4 plus 7 is 11. And at some point, you stop writing all the pieces out. And you're like, oh, I'm just adding 7 every time. That's what this means. So 18. And then 25, and then 32, and on and on and on. Andrew, you OK? An explicit formula does not rely on any preceding term. Uh, it stands alone. You can use an explicit formula to find any term without knowing previous terms. Like, you can jump to any term you like. So explicit, you, gotta, you can jump to any term you like. Recursive, you sort of have to build up to it. You can't just go find the 12th term of a recursive formula. you got to find the first 11. But an explicit formula is nicer, and we'll use explicit formulas more often, because you can just jump to any term you like. All right, the first five terms of each sequence. So a sub 1 means plug in 1. 1 over 3 plus 1. That would be one fourth. <coughs> a sub two would be two over three plus two. That would be two fifths. A sub three would be three over three plus three. Three sixths. <coughs> oh. And at some point, it would be one half, but if you want to recognize the pattern easily, easier, don't reduce it. Like, leave it that way, because I'm going to stop writing a sub 4 equals and a sub 5 equals. I'm just looking at the pattern now. 4 over 7, and then 5 over 8. And you could keep going, but it asks for the first five terms. What's old school with you? Nice. Yes. Number three. Um, again, until you recognize the pattern, you, you kind of do it rotely. You plug them in a piece at a time. And once you recognize the pattern, then you can stop doing that. So negative one squared over one. A2 would be negative 1 cubed over 2. Whoops, I did that wrong, didn't I? If I square negative 1, I get a positive 1. Negative 1 half. Thank you. Oh, he's not... No, they circled the right class, but he's not in this class anymore. Okay. So I don't know when they... Oh, student schedule as of 9.25. Got it. A sub 3, so negative 1 to the 4th, all over 3. So that'd be 1 third. Uh, we got the pattern yet? So 1, comma, negative 1 half third. What's the next term going to be? Negative one-fourth, positive one-fifth. We see this a lot in sequences and series. If you've got a negative one raised to an n or an n plus one, all that does is alternate the signs. 
right? Because it changes from positive to negative to positive to negative to positive to negative. Uh, may not need to show a whole lot of work on this one. 1 squared plus 1 would be 2. 2 squared plus 1 would be 5. 3 squared plus 1 would be 10. 4 squared plus 1 is 17. And 5 squared plus 1 would be 26. I don't know that there's an easy pattern to recognize on that one. So the second difference is the same, which means it's quadratic, which, which yeah, that fits. Yeah, 3, 5, 7, 9. Okay, so you could follow that pattern as well. All right, so a lot of times you pick up on the pattern and roll with the pattern. If you don't pick up on a pattern, no big deal. Just keep plugging in until you do. Factorials. Um, are you all familiar with factorials? If n is a positive factorial, then n factorial is defined as n factorial. Oh, I don't like how this is defined. I guess it's right. It's just they're counting up. Usually, I think a factorial is counting down. Right? Like 5 factorial, we start at 5 and count down. This, this one's counting up. But, I mean, it's the same thing. It's just usually we, we think of counting down. Zero factorial is defined to be one. Okay, that's kind of weird. Okay, it just be zero. It's defined to be one, and it's defined to be one because there are factorial equations that work a lot better if zero factorial is one. So they define it to be one to make all of the other equations work out nicely. Two factor it's like do we really need four examples of factorials? Yes. Two times one, that's two. Three times one, three factorial. That would be six. Four factorial. Um, and sometimes it's helpful to sort of recognize that four factorial is the same thing as four times three factorial. Maybe that's dumb, and it's like, well, why does that matter? I'll show you why in a minute. 4 times 6 is 24. 5 factorial, well, that would be 5 times 4 factorial. 5 times 24 is 120. Right? 5 times 20, 5 times 4. Factorials get very large very quickly. 13 factorial is like... <laughs> Conceptually, it doesn't seem that that bad, right? It's just 13 times 12 times 11 times 10 all the way down, and you end up with 6. Is that, that's not million. That's, that's billion, 6 billion. And then 20 factorial would be million, billion, trillion, quadrillion, quintillion, I think. It's a lot. All right, six factorial over two factorial, four factorial. Six times five times four times three times two times one. It's it's more convenient to write them out because you can see what simplifies. Two factorial and then four factorial. And then it's really convenient when they literally line up on top of each other. So 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, even if I don't know what it is, they cancel each other out. And 30 divided by 2 is 15. And so sometimes you can handle really large factorials <coughs> as long as things will, will factor. Like, let me squeeze in another example here. 20 factorial over 18 factorial. 
What would that be? 19 times 20. 19 times 20, right? Because 18 on down, whatever it is, it would all be canceling out. So that would be 380. And then my favorite, I think this is still true, that the calculator kind of freaks out on some of this stuff. What's 400 factorial divided by 400 factorial? What does the calculator think it is? It's like, oh, it's too big. I can't do 400 factorial. Well, yeah, 400 factorial is really big, but the calculator, I guess it, it blows up before it figures out that that's one. Kind of goofy. Then there's other things where the calculator, it, it, get, it gets confused on factorial sometimes because the numbers get so big. You're smarter than your calculator. How do you put in the exclamation point? Oh, so how do you put in the exclamation point? So 30, you go to math. And then we use it a lot with probability. So you scroll over to PRB, and then there's the exclamation point. So it can do 30 factorial. It just couldn't do 400 factorial. Um, yeah, it's another two-part test. So one, you one yeah. Number 10, n factorial over n plus 2 factorial. Well, n factorial means n times n minus 1 times n minus 2. n plus 2 factorial means n plus 2. What happens if I step down one from n plus 2? What's 1 less than n plus 2? n plus 1. And then 1 less than n plus 1 is n. And then n minus 1 and so on. And so eventually, like, oh, wait a minute. Anything from n on down cancels out. And so I'm left with 1 over n plus 2, n plus 1. Once you've done a few of these, you're not going to write that out. You're just going to kind of think through it and write the answer, and that's fine. But initially, it's probably helpful to write a couple of terms out to make sure, you know, is the top canceling, the bottom canceling, who's going where. Because, well, I distributed the exclamation part to the end of the two. Can't do that. Out don't do that. No, one. don't do that. Can't do that. Can't distribute exclamation point to those two pieces. Not distributive. So n minus 1 times n minus 2 times dot, 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 n plus 1 times n times n minus 1. And then eventually you figure out, OK, from starting at n minus 1 on down, they just cancel each other out. And I don't know, it probably looks better to put the n in front of the n plus 1. But when we were counting down, the n plus 1 came first. So either way. OK. Wait, what was that question, Addison? So why don't these go into the negatives? Because it's defined to stop when you get to 1. Because okay. obviously if you hit 0, it would wipe everything out anyway. So you stop when you get to 1. And so that, that is a little bit like there's kind of a built-in assumption here with that n minus 1. You have to assume that this is n is not 0. And it would have to be 1 or bigger for that to work. All right, series. Um, the series is a sum of numbers. So the sequence is a list of numbers. And a series is a sum of numbers. 
or if you want to be really confusing and make them all start with S, a sequence is a set and a series is a sum. Now, the good news is I don't know that we ever specifically test that so that if you got those backwards, you'd be in trouble. You, you'll be able to tell by the problem what we want you to do. So not a big deal. The sum of the first n terms of a sequence is represented by this. So have you all seen this before? Sigma notation? It's the sum. That big, that's the Greek letter S for sigma, which means sum. So yes or no, have you seen this before? Yes. Okay. So this is the sum starting at 1, going to n of a terms. I don't have room to write all that. Sum starting at 1, going to n of those terms. I is called the index of summation. Very much computer science stuff. N is the upper limit of summation. 1 is the lower limit. So we're going from 1 to n. So number 12, the sum from 1 to 5 of 3i. So we plug in 1, and then we plug in 2, and then we plug in 3, and we plug in 4, and then we plug in 5. wish this would focus a little better, but go well. So we started with 1, we went to 5. Uh, oh, I could factor a 3 out. That might make it a little easier. When it comes to actually computing this thing. 3, 6, 10, 15. 15 times 3 is 45. Um, what's what's weird about number 13, about this next one? It's got a squared. It's k rather than i, but it doesn't really matter what variable we use. Our starting number is 3, which is kind of weird to start with 3, but okay. We'll still start with 3. 1 plus 3 squared plus 1 plus 4 squared plus 1 plus 5 squared plus 1 plus 6 squared. And we stop at 6. So be careful. The top number is where you stop. It's not necessarily how many terms there are. I mean, if you start at 1, it's how many terms there are. But if you start at 3, it's not how many terms there are. Let's see, 1 plus 9 is 10, 1 plus 16 is 17, 1 plus 25 is 26, 37, let's see, 27 and 26 is 53, plus 37 is 90. So way too much mental math. Can you not do 10 plus 7 plus 26 no, no, plus 37? Yeah, you'll see me like on the side, like here in the one. <laughs> I'm going to see 53 and 37 on the side and 0 and 1. Oh, I would see 10 plus 17 yeah, written to the yeah. side? And then you would like write under it, then you would write. Or I'd be sure I'm going. Number 14. What is uh what does number fourteen start with? <coughs> and what's zero factorial? One. one. I guess I'm gonna write it out first. All the way to eight? Ah, oh, come on. One plus one plus a half plus a sixth. Well, the multiplying is not bad because I'm just multiplying by the next number, right? So six times four is 24. Five times 24 is 120. 
6 times 120 is 720. I'm nearing the end of my mental math abilities here. This, you would need a calculator. I mean, not really. You could come out to the side and look at the done the key that's already done. 1 over 5,040. Now, I could do 8 times 5,040. That I can do, because that'd be 40,000... 320 but whatever you're not gonna I'm not gonna ask you that by hand the the point of that one is that if you kept going actually let me show you what this is equal to again with the calculator 2.718 you may recognize that number at least to the first E. Now we stopped at 8, so that's not really E. That's a little bit short of E. We'd have to keep adding them up. <coughs> so this is kind of a calculus thing. E is the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of 1 over n factorial. Oops, sorry. That sort of hints at a whole other issue. I'm adding up an infinite number of positive numbers and not getting infinity. That, that should trouble you, right? It's like, wait a minute. I'm going to add up an infinite number of positive numbers. So I'm not you know, cheating and throwing in zeros or negatives. Like I'm adding up an infinite number of positive numbers and landing at some regular old number, not going to infinity. I always thought that was kind of weird. We'll get to that on uh, Monday, why that works. All right, that would not be a no calculator problem. A couple things about this, though. Um, number 12, how many terms did number 12 have? Good. Started at 1, went to 5, 5 terms. Nice. Number 13. Started at 3, went to 6. How many terms is that? Yeah. Be careful. It's not 3. You can't just do 6 minus 3 because that would mean you didn't include the third term. Three, so so you got to include 3. So it's 6 minus 3 plus 1. Or what most people do, they're like, well, 3rd, 4th. Fifth, six. That's four terms. How many terms did uh, number fourteen have? So be careful with number of terms. You can't just grab the top number and be like, ah, oh, eight terms. I mean, if it starts at one, you can, and you can't just do top minus bottom because that's always off by a little bit. Definition of series. Consider the infinite sequence. The sum of the first n terms of the sequence is called a finite series. Again, don't go forever. You stop somewhere. Or the nth partial sum. Partial because we didn't go all the way. All the way meaning to infinity. And we already talked about what this this means feels a little out of order here. The sum of all the terms of an infinite sequence is called an infinite series. And it looks like that. So it's like 1 to infinity and then dot 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 because you never get there. Can be tricky. How many how many terms does uh, this series have? Infinite. Oh, what if we started at zero? How many terms would it have? Still infinite. It's also kind of weird. What if we started at a th the thousandth term? Infinite. Infinity. There's some fun math dealing with infinity. Let's see if we can figure this one out. Consider the series the sum from n equals 1 to infinity. Okay. So, how long is it going to take to add these up? 
Yeah, forever. Um, well, we'll worry about that in a minute. Find the third partial sum. Okay, I can get the. I can add three numbers up. That I can do. So that'd be three tenths plus three over one hundred plus three over a thousand. So that would be 0 0.3 plus 0 0.03 plus 0 0.003. The third. Uh, is it a third? Well, not, not a third. It's a little bit shy of a third. Um, if you did the fraction, if you got a common denominator, it would be 333 over 1,000, but that's still not a third. Find the sum of the series, like all the way to infinity. 0.3 plus 0.03 plus 0.003 plus plus dot dot dot. That's point three 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 forever. So that is a third. Little side note here. You can don't have to write this down. Stop the video. We don't need this on there.